Hello, Glenn. Welcome to our conference. Thank you. Well, I, I'm a scientist. I'm, I have a PhD in biochemistry, neurochemistry, actually. I, I left conventional medical, biomedical research behind. Uh, I used to work at, at two work at the Institute of Heart Math uh, many, many years ago. Uh, speaking of DNA, Dan's favorite subject. Uh, I was the one that they hot, they were interested in my work because I was measuring chain, winding and unwinding of DNA with healers and they got all excited. They wanted to hire me and I ended up staying there for like three years. And then I left and I got uh, <clears throat> involved with uh, several different startup companies, one of which was a structured water company, which uh, actually did measure structuring of the water using NMR spectroscopy. And uh, then I moved to the East Coast and now I have uh, my own lab and I uh, still have my own lab. And I do water research as well as DNA research, which is what uh, Roger asked me to talk about. So uh, that's a nice change. I'm gonna talk about water. Shall I just continue? Yeah, go for it, Glenn. I'll go for it, yeah. And then Roger said, well, you're going to talk about water. Talk about water and consciousness. And I'm going, okay, well, that's an interesting topic. And <clears throat> you could say Dan covered the whole thing by saying, well, the hydrogen bond is the precursor to everything on the planet, including our own consciousness. But I'd like to examine that statement in a little more detail because uh, it is an interesting question. Okay, so uh, let's start with consciousness. My definition of consciousness is that it is a fundamental energy underlying and manifesting all other energies <clears throat> and all biological processes in the body as well as in the universe. So it's uh, rather universal to say the least. Uh, it <clears throat> informs matter at the molecular level and at the subatomic level. and it is our link to the divine. So when we, you know, when I talk about consciousness, the thing that interests me the most is how to raise our consciousness, uh, because you know there's a lot of left brain physicists out there talking about consciousness uh, from a um, theoretical quantum physics point of view, and and by now it's pretty well established that consciousness is some kind of quantum uh, event event. But we're going to go into that in a, in a little more detail. But most of the scientists are focused on the neurological correlates of consciousness. That is to say, what, where is consciousness in the brain? How, how does it affect the brain? And what are the molecules, if you will, listed here that mediate consciousness? And water indeed is, is one of them, but it, I only found, I did actually find two scientific articles where they discussed water and consciousness. And uh, I called on those two articles in my, in my talk, as well as the original research that I did, which was to show that consciousness affects water. So clearly, you know, the, the um, imploder affects the water, but some of those changes can actually be produced just by thinking and focusing our conscious intention on the water. And we'll get to that in more detail. So anyway, so, uh, and so it, instead of the um, neurological correlates of consciousness, I want to address the energetic correlates of consciousness. That is to say, what is the energetic nature of consciousness? And there's a lot of um, theories out there. So it's all theory, right? Because how do you measure <laughs> this phenomenon, right? Uh, a lot of theories about electromagnetic fields in the old days, whether they're longitudinal or, or, um, uh, or um, uh, horizontal uh, scalar or, or longitudinal or transverse, that, that's the word. Uh, now, more recently, there's some quantum theories out there, and this is like taking quantum field theory and applying it to the brain, uh, which is now called quantum brain dynamics. Uh, and they talk about everything that you can imagine right down to the electrons and the protons that Dan mentioned so thoroughly. So I'm not gonna talk much about protons because Dan covered that so well, but uh, 
just while we're on this subject, there is also a phenomenon called beyond the quantum level, even in the scientific community. But for, for me and for uh, my particular interest in this subject, to me, beyond quantum is where the divine spiritual essence is. And this is the domain of virtual energy and uh, negative energy and, and, all, and all of those interesting phenomena in quantum physics that's all put into this lump sum called virtual energy because they don't know where else to put it and they don't know what it is. All right, so anyway, that's my, uh, th oh, so continuing on the beyond quantum theory, we have a little more scientific version of that. And that is to say, it is where, it is the combination of quantum theory and relativity, which <clears throat> is actually being sought out by physicists. And it is called the theory of everything because it would be everything as Dan kind of boiled it down to the hydrogen hydrogen um, atom, uh, they, these people think more in terms of fields rather than in terms of particles. And I kind of tend to agree with that because to me, it's all about energy uh, and rather than matter and particles, but I'm biased. But, you know, physicists are split between the, 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 the uh, people who are focused on the ma matter and people who are focused on the energy. So anyway, these, so what it involves really in, in another level is to say it's like the superposition of two different quantum states to go beyond the single quantum system. You have, you can have multiple quantum parameters and not only can they be superimposed, but these parameters can evolve and change over time. And one of the most interesting uh, uh, core, uh, statements about this beyond quantum is the inclusion of consciousness, uh, which is um, interesting. And needless to say, the focus of this particular talk, Jack Serfati is someone who has talked a lot about this. Uh, and uh, he also goes beyond the particle into um, energy fields, uh, David Bohm's pilot waves, for example. Uh, and here the focus is on the energy, not on the particles. And this kind of approach explains everything from, from, like I said, negative energy to time reversal and all these anomalies in physics that cannot be explained by other means. So I'm going to ask the question, I'm going to go beyond, beyond physics and, and go into the spiritual realm and ask, where is the, our divine essence stored? And my hypothesis is that it's stored in the water in the body. So therefore, we're going to be linking the consciousness to water. And then, I mean, if you think about it, it makes a lot of sense because well, we know that water can store conscious intention. And I will give some experimental data on that, including my own. And not only can the water store this information, but it can be read by biological systems. So it can inform biological systems. And and tell it what to do in essence. And that this process of storage and, and uh, retrieval of information is a quantum process. And that consciousness um, is very much linked to coherence. Coherence is a key magic word. And here we're talking about quantum coherence. And we'll talk a little bit about that. And needless to say, when you put coherence into water, uh, it increases health and it raises consciousness. And, and I'm sure Dan would, would say that the imploder increases coherence in the water. Uh, although I have not seen any direct measurements. And I, I tend to make statements that are based either on theoretical physics or experimental data. Okay, so let's go back to living water, bio water, water in the body is um, <clears throat> uh, exists in many different states. So here I'm making an analogy between different states of water and different states of consciousness. I mean, this is the most simple way I can explain it because you, when you get into the physics of, of both of those subjects, it gets very technical, very fast. So the best and easiest way to think about it is water exists in many different states. Um, and these different states can interconvert. You can shift from one to another. 
the different states can evolve, as I said before, the different states can superimpose on each other. And uh, this makes it very complicated. But when you combine all of those factors, you can generate what's called higher order states. And, th and this is the quantum and, and super quantum, if you will. Uh, and for me, the most fascinating question about this is how do you transform the lower states of water into the higher states? And can the higher states of water be associated with higher states of consciousness? And can this transduction phenomena, transformation phenomena be used to help us raise our consciousness? I mean, for me, that's what the goal of all this is about. I mean, you know, water, <laughs> the science of water is, is very materialistic, if you will, unless we're talking about the quantum properties, which is what we are going to talk about. So here we are. So I've got to boil down to three aspects of, of water that are the most important. Water clusters, coherent domains, and water nano bubbles, which we've already talked about in this conference. And, and in the interest of time, I don't even, I'm not going to really talk about bubbles. There's plenty to talk about, about everything else. Believe me. Okay, so let's start with the structured state of water. And this is, <clears throat> occurs at, at, at all biological interfaces between where water touches some kind of a biological surface, whether it's a molecule or a cell. And this has been known for many, many years. It's, it's well studied. It was called interfacial water in the beginning. Now Jerry Pollack calls it easy water and lots of scientific studies. Uh, and it's even known that these water clusters that surround biological molecules affect the function of the molecules and the cell. So this is not just a protective layer, which it also is around the cells and molecules, but it actually is directly controls the function of the biological system. Uh, they, they could be, uh, this could be considered kind of a liquid crystalline state. It's, it's not a solid crystal, but it is uh, certainly structured and organized like a crystal. Uh, crystals can be very large or they can be very small. And uh, it turns out these small ones are interesting. I think Jay, as Jason actually said earlier, that small ones can get through the cell membrane. True. But they also have some other really interesting properties. Uh, one of which is the fact that they're held together by hydrogen bonds. And hydrogen bonds are particularly interesting because what Dan Winter said an hour, two hours ago about its fundamental nature in the universe. So um, these clusters are held together by hydrogen bonds. That's important. Uh, clusters uh, protect the body. Yes, uh, uh, I want to share an experiment I recently did with structured water. That is to say, water that has been, is commercially available, it is proven to be structured, and it may very well be different than mag magnetic water, which we don't know that it is structured, but this water was shown to be structured by virtue of uh, uh, O17 NMR spectroscopy, which uh, the Japanese discovered as a way of measuring structured water. But anyway, the point is that when you put DNA, okay, I'm going to talk about DNA. Oh, sorry. I just can't help myself. All right, so here we have it. DNA surrounded by regular water in a test tube. You put, you put a cell phone next to it and you damage the DNA. That's pretty well established. And I've done that in my own lab and confirmed the previous experiments. When you do the same experiment, except you put the DNA in structured water and then you zap it with a cell phone, there's absolutely no damage at all. So structured water protects the cells from uh, electromagnetic frequencies and also from heat uh, because heat will cause uh, decoherence and break apart the quantum properties of the, of the molecules themselves. But when the molecules are surrounded by structured water, it, it prevents the decoherence and maintains the quantum state. Okay, so, uh, qu and of course, quantum, finally, quantum, I'm sorry, hydrogen bonds themselves uh, exhibit quantum tunneling. 
That is to say, the electrons and protons can tunnel from the positive and negative uh, sides of the hydrogen bond. The hydrogen bond connects uh, the, <clears throat> the positively charged part of water to the negatively charged part of another water molecule. And that bond is called a hydrogen bond. It's not a covalent bond. It's a special kind of bond which exhibits quantum tunneling. So there we have the essence of structured water. A little bit more on structured water. I've said most of this, but here's a little picture showing the um, internal charged material or molecule, and then an inner shell and an outer shell. And uh, just for a visual, then we have um, what's called the hydration shell. Not only can it surround minerals and nutrients, but can also surround gases like oxygen. Um, I've said that, uh, hi, ah, yes, the, hi, the, hi, the um, hydration shell around molecules is highly coherent. And this is why it can store information. And we're going to get to that in a little more detail. But talking about coherence, it's worth now associating coherence with the structuring of water. So here's uh, more visuals for you. On the left box, we have everything from a single hydrogen molecule to a, a, a threesome, <laughs> didn't mean that literally, uh, to a, a, a four, five, and six clusters of different waters. And it turns out that, as I said, water can also exist in very, very large uh, structures on the right, where you can have hundreds of individual water molecules clustering together. And the goal is to break that down into the smaller ones, because it turns out the smaller ones, and particularly the hexagonal and pentagonal ones, have all those biological effects. Okay, and for example, hexagonal water structures uh, actually uh, are the kind of water that is found in Lord's water. Someone asked a question about sacred waters. Well, Lord's water is one of the examples of a natural formed spring water, I guess you could call it, uh, where people have been going for thousands of years and drinking the water and getting healed. Uh, but of course, it's not the only one on the planet. There are other hot springs than other sacred waters. But a colleague of mine, Lee Lorenzen, actually got some of this Lord's water and did this NMR spectroscopy. And turns out it is hexagonal in nature. And, and that is the basis of the water that he developed <clears throat> to mimic Lord's water with this hexagonal structure. Okay, so now the question is, uh, or the statement is, it looks like we don't have to resort to nature to structure water, but we can do it in the lab using modern technology. Now, <clears throat> what, it, mostly electromagnetic fields and light. In fact, Jerry Pollock himself was the one that discovered that light makes his um, easy cluster uh, uh, structured water larger. And he, as he measured that, when you shine light on, on a molecule with surrounded by a structured water, the, um, the structuring expands. Uh, <clears throat> so then commercially available water that is structured and been measured to, and proven to be structured are, are two that I know of, really only two that I know of, but that's not to say there are others. It's just most people who sell structured water don't measure NMR spectroscopy or near-infrared spectroscopy or Raman spectroscopy to prove that their water is structured. And part of the problem is that the structuring doesn't last very long. So, uh, however, these two waters, pental water and vivo water, uh, pentagonal and hexagonal respectively, are stable enough that they can be measured with these various forms of spectroscopy. They're both treated with energy in different kinds of ways, and they both produce a variety of biological effects, which Jason just summarized for magnetic water, we don't know that all of those effects also uh, apply to structured water, but uh, at least some of them have been um, demonstrated in the lab. 
Okay, so now moving on, still have a lot to cover. Uh, <clears throat> in fact, we have, okay, so we basically covered this. Uh, structured water is quantum. And okay, now we wanna talk about the difference between structuring water, structured water and coherent domains in water. This is another uh, organization, if you will, a uh, configuration, uh, it's a minimum energy configuration of individual molecules, which are not connected by the hydrogen bond. They're connected by um, long range electromagnetic fields, potential fields and quantum fields. Unlike structured water, which is connected by uh, the hydrogen bond, which is an electrostatic or like an electric field kind of uh, energetic bond. <clears throat> Co coherent domains were discovered uh, by an Italian theoretical physicist uh, using quantum field theory to predict these phenomena, which explain a lot of the anomalous properties of water you know, well and beyond what the structuring and the clustering of water can produce. And the, the physics and the science behind quantum domains gets pretty complicated because it is a, a quantum event. Uh, the way these molecules are organized has a lot to do, their geometry, if you will, has to do with how their different oscillations, because each water molecule oscillates, uh, <clears throat> uh, at a specific frequency, which Dan was talking about. But in a coherent domain, these oscillations are organized, they're coherent, they're coordinated, and they dynamically interact in such a way <clears throat> that, <clears throat> that they're, um, the energy fields that support this structure uh, are trapped because it's it's a it's a it's a structure. It's not you know just the molecules come together. But I, I don't know how they're enclosed. I don't know what kind of encasing they have around them. But they are uh, a, a concrete domain which is separate from bulk water. And the energy fields inside that are trapped inside uh, exhibit quantum properties. And that's one of the unique. Uh, phenomena associated with the coherent domains. Okay, the coherent domains are, are primarily described, yes, by the fields, the quantum fields inside, but also by the electric dipole moment inside, which is another fancy way of just saying the positive and negative charges within the molecule um, oscillate and have rather unusual properties. The electric dipole itself is, it generates a dipole field, which is different than an ordinary electromagnetic field. It vibrates, it spins, it, it changes its form. It, it's got a lot of free electrons. It's got interesting properties, but it's different than the positive and negative bond in the hydrogen bond. Do I have a picture of that? Yeah, so here's a picture of the hydrogen bond, and you can see the um, the um, the bars, the vertical bars in the in the picture in the upper right hand corner, is a depiction of the hydrogen bond. <clears throat> and um, hydrogen bonds are are similar but different than um, the uh, coherent domain bonds, but in both cases, they are extremely sensitive to external energies, electromagnetic energy, scalar energy, and bioenergy, which is another word for consciousness. That's why I'm sharing all this with you, basically, because this um, way of looking at the structure of water molecules and the substructure, the atomic, subatomic level, is where scientists think the consciousness resides. Ah, okay, so here's a little bit more about the dipole moment. Here's a picture of the dipole moment. Uh, and these two um, particles here in the upper right hand corner typically are the electron and the proton. So this is at the subatomic level. Uh, they, as I said, they oscillate, they rotate, they generate harmonic frequencies. 
and they respond to energies, as I just said a second ago. Okay, so there's a dipole moment. Now, uh, extending this argument <clears throat> of the different states of water, as we discussed earlier, into and compared to electron states, because electrons themselves don't only exist in one state. Um, uh, for a start, they, they exist in the ground state and an excited state. When they're excited, they, they jump to a higher energy level uh, in the, in the um, or molecular orbit, the, the amorphous electron clouds that surround every atom. Um, so that here I want to make a parallel between what, what different states the electron uh, can be in and that water can be in because, you know, um, the hydrogen proton, as Dan pointed out so well, is, is an integral part of the water. And uh, that's why we, it, and protons and electrons behave kind of similar. They, they all have uh, quantum properties. They can be symmetrical, they can be non-symmetrical, they can be coherent, they can be super coherent. They exist in high energy states and low energy states, high entropy states, low entropy states. And the bottom line is classical states versus quantum states. Uh, so if we take that analogy and bring it to water and then bring it right to human consciousness itself, we can make a parallel between the electronic level, the macroscopic properties of water, and the universal properties of consciousness. <sighs> okay, I think I've said basically what I wanted to say there. Now, uh, a particularly a particular interest to me is this business about transforming <clears throat> or transitioning from one state to another state, whatever level we're talking about, atomic or molecular. Because this is what consciousness, I think, is, is all about. It, it, to go from a lower state to a higher state, from an unorganized state to a more organized state, uh, and, and from, uh, an ex from a ground state to an excited state. Uh, now, some transitions, it's worth mentioning, in physics are allowed and some are forbidden. So why are they forbidden? That always gets me. As soon as they, you know, this is an exception to the rule, right? And that, that gets my attention. Anything that's different than the norm. So I don't really know the answer to that, but maybe some of the people in the audience can talk about why some transitions are forbidden. But if they're forbidden, then I'm interested. It, it's almost like, you know, like, like junk DNA, right? Go back to the DNA story. Well, yeah, you know, it's junk. That means it's not allowed. It's forbidden. It's garbage. I mean, <laughs> that's where all the really interesting scientists, uh, uh, science occurs, in my humble opinion. Okay, so uh, so this business about transiting from one state to another is, is important, not only when we're talking about the particles themselves or the, en the energy fields themselves, but the mathematical equations that describe the energy fields. And in, in, in a quantum field, that mathematical function is called the wave function. And in physics, quantum physics, one of the major hypotheses is that consciousness causes the collapse of the wave function, which is a mouthful. I don't really have time to talk about it, but the point is when it wave function collapses, it changes its state. It goes from an organized state or a, a, a being to a, a non-organized state of non-being and what happens to consciousness i mean it, it's kind of vague concept but it seems consciousness is able to make this mathematical formula let alone the energy it describes go from an inorganized state to an organized state from a classical state to a quantum state and that's kind of to me kind of where it's all at because that's the goal of all this stuff to be able to apply it to our own consciousness and to be able to use this scientific knowledge to be able to figure out how to do that in our own consciousness, move to a higher state. Okay, okay. So in the interest of time, I think I've said everything I want to say about this. Bio water, <clears throat> let's talk a little bit more about two different kinds of bio water. The bio water that's on the outside of cells 
and uh, molecules and what's inside. On the outside, we have the hydration shell, which I talked about pretty much before, hydrogen bonds. Uh, we talked about this before, but <clears throat> I just want to bring this up in comparison to the kind of water that's inside a molecule or inside what's called a cavity. The two cavities that have been studied the most <clears throat> are um, water, uh, not water, uh, DNA, because DNA is, is a hollow tube, basically, and microtubules. And there's an enormous amount of research now about consciousness and microtubules. And in fact, it is the water inside the microtubules that is what the uh, scientists believe is where the loci of consciousness is. And this water inside the uh, molecule is a quantum uh, uh, type of water. It is, they use kind of magic words like self-trapped and self-focused. I think Dan even used that word. Uh, <clears throat> and it's highly coherent. It's super conducting. It's super radiant. I mean, this is like a super coherent state. This is beyond regular kind of coherence. This is a super coherence. This is what was associated with the beyond the quantum we talked about before. And <clears throat> this is uh, where the, the transformation from incoherent energy into coherent energy is. It's all in, it, it, and it's, it's all a function of the dipoles that we talked about before that give it this magic property. But this is the point that this, water within a molecule behaves very different than water outside of a molecule if it's trapped. Okay, so there we go. So let's look at the experimental evidence now. Two kinds of evidence. We've got the theoretical evidence and everything up until now has been based on quantum theory and, and theory. So now we're going to move into experimental data and the experimental section, part two, is best studied by measuring the effect of various kinds of energies on water. If water is going to carry the information associated with an energy field, it has to initially affect the water in some way, then it has to store the information, and then it has to deliver that information throughout the body to all the molecules and cells. And needless to say, water does that all three of those things. So in terms of uh, physical effects, uh, let's start with the electromagnetic fields because it was to say most research has been done with electromagnetic fields. And all these different things have been measured, properties of water, uh, and including and, uh, the two on the bottom, I actually uh, measured myself. And it's not surprising, but well established. Now, now here we have to make a distinction between imprinting water and structuring water. Because when you treat water with a magnetic field, yes, you Im can imprint it, but you don't necessarily structure it. And this is a confusion that a lot of people have. And I'd like to clarify that by making a distinction between the two things. You can change the properties of water, uh, but Structuring it is a whole different thing because if you structure it properly, it lasts for months, if not years, whereas imprinting can oftentimes only lasts for days or weeks. Okay, so that whole field of storing information in water started in 1995 by a Russian scientist who said, <clears throat> asked the question, well, we zap a, a cells with an electromagnetic field and change the cells, the behavior of the cells, the biochemistry of the cells. What, all cells are surrounded by water. What role does water have in this effect? In bioelectromagnetic uh, societies, a whole society of engineers and biologists running around talking about how electromagnetic fields affect cells. So this, this brilliant Russian decided to treat the water with the energy field and then give the water to the cells sep as a separate thing. And that any, like, you know, days later and any information that the water picked up 
uh, was stored in the water, and the, this is they actually measured the opening of the potassium channel in tissue culture cells. Uh, oh, this effect only lasted 20 minutes, but of course now we can make it last longer when we use other than electromagnetic fields. Anyway, <clears throat> that's the point that um, electromagnetic fields have all the properties I just outlined. But now the question is, what studies have been done with consciousness and intention or conscious intention and water uh, properties and storing water? So again, just like with electromagnetic fields, all these different studies have been done showing that consciousness affects these various properties of the water. Uh, I mean, I, I even include Emoto here, but I probably shouldn't because it wasn't really not done scientifically. Um, my own work, I guess we'll talk about in, in a minute, if I have time, the way things are going. So then the question becomes, can conscious, okay, well, before, oh, sorry, okay, direct effects. Here's some uh, other colleagues' uh, work before I talk about my own. Water, con consciousness affecting the pH of water. Okay, so, you know, in Roger's experiments in the desert there, yeah, they brought the pH down, but you could do that just by intending it. And, and I'm sure that everyone in Roger's group it, was trying to bring the pH from, down from 13 so they could grow something. So that's a big part of how that water was changed. But here, this is a Bill Tiller's research on water and consciousness. And the large um, peaks and troughs at the top is the, is the temperature of water and uh, uh, below it, we have the pH water, and you can see these very symmetrical, coherent waves that are created. So consciousness can actually produce coherence in the water. This is a major statement demonstrated by Professor Tiller's work in the subject. Another good example of how consciousness can affect water is an experiment that was done in Japan where they had people in these yellow circles uh, uh, surrounding the lake praying for the water to clean up the water and I don't know if you can see the bottom line because in my thing that's got all these uh, uh, blocks on it but anyway the point is that consciousness they measured uh, the chemical toxins in the water, and after people prayed and meditated and projected their intention into the lake, the chemical toxin levels were lowered. I think this is a really cool study. Okay, and here's uh, Emoto's work. Everybody knows Emoto's work. Okay, so now we're going to talk about uh, uh, what happens if you treat the water and then store the information from consciousness. Again, this is just with the healer or with a Qigong master or whatever. Uh, here's two uh, uh, studies that were done, one by Emoto, uh, where he measured the effect of the water, the, in, the water with the information in it to uh, <clears throat> protect from microwave damage. And another study was to actually remove asbestos. This is an indirect, what I call an indirect effect. You treat the water and then you give the water to the, to the, uh, to the person or whatever. And some experiments that I did uh, with tumor cells grown in tissue culture where <clears throat> the water in, informed with the intention of the healer could inhibit the growth of tumor cells and actually change DNA. Now, what's interesting about these experiments is that opposite intentions can have opposite effects. And then I ask the question, because I love to ask this question, not because it's a great song, but it's a very profound statement when you ask the question, what does love have to do with it? And it turns out that in order to, for conscious intention to produce these kind of effects, in order for the energy coming from a person's consciousness, if you will, to resonate with water and get stored in water, there has to be a certain amount of love present. Unconditional love 
is what HeartMath, we were doing at HeartMath, demonstrating that, yes, in fact, that's an important component of all the effects that we observe. When the heart is coherent, it produces this kind of special love energy, we'll call it. And the experiments that I did uh, with the tumor growth showed that unconditional love alone was not enough. You needed to have the intention as well. Okay, so I see I'm running out of time. So I'm gonna skip over my part, which is experiments not in my lab. Um, my lab hasn't changed much from these days. Glenn, Glenn yeah. it's Roger here. Uh, feel free to go over, a we, we, we only have lunch, so this is wonderful material. Okay. So feel free to, okay. you know, okay. yeah, Thank you're, 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 you're doing great. All right, okay. Uh, <clears throat> nice to hear that there's somebody at the other end. It's very strange talking to myself. Uh, uh, but anyway, so here's a picture uh, of me in a former life. And these days, uh, it's pretty much the same. I don't wear the same kind of lab coat. I don't, certainly don't wear a yarmulke, although I am Jewish. Anyway, the point is that um, I've done these kind of experiments <clears throat> uh, supporting the conclusions that I just said a minute ago. Uh, so this is imprinting water, just changing the, the amount of oxygen in water. And this has been done with um, ultraviolet spectroscopy because that peak there is a measure of the oxygen content. And you can actually, you can see here's a schematic drawing of the different ways that that peak changes depending on the kind of energy that you treat the water with. Whether it's consciousness, whether it's a classical electromagnetic field or whether it's a scalar electromagnetic field. They all produce changes in this parameter, but all slightly different way, demonstrated by a change in the shape of that peak, the oxygen peak. Interesting conclusion. Okay, so uh, pH, uh, conscious intention to change pH. This was done by Carolyn Corey, uh, who uh, is a filmmaker, and you may have seen some of her films. <clears throat> she's also a very powerful healer. And in the very beginning, her intention was to decrease the pH and the pH went down a little bit. And then it, when it reached uh, the bottom there, she uh, changed her intention. Uh, this is a, a recording in real time. So the X axis here is time and the Y axis is pH. And then when she shifted her intention to increase that pH, you could see the pH went from 7.45 up to 7.8 uh, uh, in a relatively short amount of time, a rather large effect. Uh, so it looks like it, it likes to, it's easier to increase the pH than to decrease the pH or whatever that's worth. Uh, anyway, so uh, another important uh, conclusion from these kind of studies, just the imprinting of water with consciousness. Um, electromagnetic fields will do the same trick, but it takes 24 hours to imprint water with an electromagnetic field and a healer can do it in a matter of a minute or two. An important distinction to be made. Um, water, and is, as I've concluded before, that water does remember this information and I've also done experiments with how long that lasts. I didn't even include that data. Uh, when the water is treated with an electromagnetic field, it lasts for several days. When a water is treated with conscious intention, it lasts for two months so far and counting. So there's another distinction between, you know, what we can do with our own consciousness and what we can do with a, a, a machine or an electromagnetic field made from a machine. Okay, so here's the experiments I was talking about with tumor growth, uh, tumor cells and tissue culture, and the healer treated the water with different intentions. And these are the three intentions that were used that were the most effective, uh, well, actually the most effective was the first one, number one. Uh, returning the water to its natural order and harmony. And this gave like a 30% uh, change in uh, the, uh, the growth of the tumor cells. Now, unconditional love, as I said earlier, 
uh, only works if you have um, love, uh, 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 the, the intention present. So you need both the emotional love energy and the mental focus of intention to really produce this kind of effect. Either one by itself either doesn't work or works poorly. And the third intention that worked very well was what he called uh, uh, the healer was Leonard Laskow, experiments I did like 20 years ago. Uh, what he called dematerialization, where, where you go in there and you release any negative energy from the system. So that shows you how different intentions can have very profound and different effects. And I more or less uh, stated everything on here. 24 hours. Yeah. Okay. That's covered. Okay. Now, another series of experiments I did was not with tumor cells, but with DNA. Needless to say, I have to say something about DNA if Dan is in the audience. <clears throat> and this, these experiments were done where the healer treated the water, and then you add the water to the DNA, and then you measure the electrical conductivity, or actually resistance or impedance. So what is the data shown here is, is, is resistance and impedance measurements, which is the opposite of conductivity. So as you see, for example, distilled water on the far left gives about a 25% decrease in resistance, which would mean 25% increase in conductivity. And spring water is not quite as efficient, which is interesting because spring water on the right, on the far right, has got added minerals to it. So when you add minerals, certain kinds of minerals, it weakens the effect. And saline, which just has one mineral, sodium chloride, in, in essence, distilled water, produces the exact opposite effect. It, it, it increases the resistance or lowers the conductivity. I still can't explain this, and we could open this to the discussion, but not only is the intention critical, but the kind of water that you use, critical and the presence of minerals in the water, critical. Okay, and you can see the control variation is pretty much plus and minus 8%. So when we're seeing a 20% change, this is way above and beyond the uh, <clears throat> experimental error from the controls. Okay, so along with these studies, I was very interested in co directly comparing direct versus indirect and it was done with, with three different systems uh, and the kind of recording that was used to record the energy uh, makes an enormous difference. And so it, the far right was the best of the three and that was done by a company called Chibox uh, that uh, used a scalar antenna to store the energy of the healer. And uh, this is not the topic of this convers of this lecture, but uh, this is the whole topic in itself. But a point I want to make here is that that was the best of the three ways of doing it. When you able to say that the direct energy of a healer, the direct energy of consciousness on a biological system versus the indirect way method where the water is treated and then you give and, and stores the information, it gives very similar effects, although direct consciousness effects are always larger. Okay. Okay, so consciousness, uh, okay. Now my measurements of measuring electrical conductivity uh, and, uh, okay, so to go, go into a little more detail, I use two different methods to measure the electrical properties of water. One is the conductivity measure and the other is what I call resonance frequency spectroscopy. And if people really want, I'll go into that in more detail, but um, the, the, the trick about electro conductivity, uh, I'll just do it, but I'll do it fast, is that when you take the measurements, you have to take the measurements not at a fixed arbitrary frequency like most conductivity meters are fixed at two kilohertz. And taking a measurement at two kilohertz is very limiting. You need to take a measurement at the resonance frequency of the target. If the target, in this case, the target is water in all the experiments I'm talking about, and one of the resonance frequencies of water is 42.7 kilohertz, which is the Keeley frequency, which is known to implode water. And I'm sure Dan will want to 
talk about this, but that's the frequency that I use to actually measure the conductivity. Okay. And here's an example, of the kind of effects you get. Again, you're treating the water and then uh, you measure the, this is measuring the conductivity of the water itself. Okay, nothing stored, direct effect. Different healers have uh, all decreased the, again, this is the resistance. So the resistance is lower, but the conductivity increases. I'm showing in the raw data, but in all cases, all healers increase the conductivity of water, which is what you want. That's a good thing, although to varying degrees. Now, even more bizarre is similar to what I've talked about before. The same experiment with one healer doing three different intentions. And you can see that the, after completely, you know, the first two times they did it, it was like, okay, you're, you're increasing the conductivity like everybody else. Resistance goes down. Can you do the opposite? And they were able to do the opposite in the intention number three. I don't know exactly what they did in their head, but they were able to do the opposite and produce the, uh, the opposite effect to <clears throat> decrease the conductivity. Okay, so now the resonance frequency spectroscopy, what I call, is based on electrochemical impedance spectroscopy. Re resonance frequency spectroscopy, uh, you, you apply a voltage and you measure the induced current at specific frequencies and the, the induced response varies in the shape, the magnitude, polarity, it's a very rather complex system. And this is the system that I use. I use uh, it, it to excite the system. I use AC and DC. I use flat counter wound Tesla coils. So I have two coils, one that generates the signal and one that receives the signal. They're they're wound in opposite directions, the, and the electrodes are dissimilar metals. Now, dissimilar metals by themselves actually produce a bunch of really interesting effects. And there's a lot of science that indicate that you can actually generate uh, in the space between two dissimilar metals, you can generate a, a, an electrical tunneling effect, which is a quantum effect. So I use all of these different parameters. To, to, to measure the frequencies of a system. In this case, water. This is an example of the raw data that you get. And you can see that the frequencies, uh, the peaks rather, are rather discrete. Uh, the one in the center left is the largest one, but notice in the center right, there's a peak that goes down. So that's a negative peak. And I see that Often there's always positive and negative peaks present in water at very specific frequencies, resonance frequencies. Here's an experiment that I did with consciousness, intention, treating water and measuring the frequencies of the water. So the dogma here is that <clears throat> consciousness is supposed to raise your frequency and raise the frequency of everything it touches, you know, like the Midas touch, you know. We're not turning things into gold, we're just raising their frequency. Well, it turns out that's not quite, the tr quite true. It is in some cases. If you look at the 1.04 to 1.01 peak on the left, center left, if you can see that small print, uh, in that, that particular peak, which shows up at 1.1 after treatment, was 1.0 before treatment. So in that case, the frequency was raised. However, the largest peak, 2.75 kilohertz, yeah, these are kilohertz, um, actually went down because it started at 2.93 kilohertz and went down significantly to 2.75 kilohertz. On the other hand, <clears throat> frequencies in the far left of 631 hertz is exactly the same uh, with before and after treatment. That didn't change at all. Now, the, the, the frequency itself, what I'm measuring, the amplitude at that frequency changes, but that's a different point. So the dogma apparently is not quite as, it's not quite as simple as that, that consciousness raises your frequency, or in this case, water. Okay, so I'm almost finished.
uh, uh, the last thing I wanted to talk about is coherence and how to measure coherence in water. And the way to do that is by measuring what's called the Lissajou Lis patterns. And that's how they're spelled. Um, and there's scientific evidence linking the Lissajou patterns to believe it or not, coupling between the transverse and longitudinal uh, components which generates a kind of coherent wave. That's a quote from a scientific article. And another quote states that, uh, no, sorry, that's the quote. Uh, and what Lissajou patterns really are, are interacting phase shifted sine waves. Two such sine waves, when, they, when their phase shifts, they interact in a very unusual way and form patterns. Now, you can measure these patterns with my frequency spectrum uh, uh, analyzer, um, spect spect frequency <clears throat> spectroscopy. And here is the difference between a coherent and incoherent pattern. Uh, needless to say, on the bottom, it, it is beautiful, coherent, organized structure generated through intention. When the healer treats the water, it goes into this coherent mode. So that supports all the conclusions that I uh, want to make that I, I've sort of said indirectly before, this is almost like a summary slide, but it looks like consciousness creates coherence in water. And this is uh, the goal of all of this, to be able to, to use this information to help us raise our consciousness. Here's a quote from an article that I read, which one of the two articles I found that links consciousness and water. The backbone for consciousness is provided in the activity of ordered water and its coupling to dipole oscillations. Ordered water is another word for structured water and the dipole oscillations is what I was talking about earlier about the dipole in the, quant in the coherent domains in the water molecules as they organize in a coherent kind of way. Uh, and there's also one other uh, piece of experimental data to support this hypothesis is that you can measure this kind of coherence using neutron scattering technology, very sophisticated. I certainly don't have that in my lab. Uh, maybe Dan has access to that with his uh, group in Marseille, uh, but that, uh, that consciousness can actually uh, produce a symmetry breaking dynamic, which is the key to this coherence phenomenon. So my last slide is the connection between activating a molecule, whether it's a water molecule, a DNA molecule, or a microtubule molecule, and awakening and ascending our consciousness. This is what the talk's all about, the link between molecules, in this case, water, and our consciousness. And <clears throat> then the question is, well, if there is such a link, how can we use this knowledge to facilitate or raise our consciousness? Okay, well, one thing we could do is to increase the clusters in water, if you remember way back an hour ago. Well, one way to do that is by drinking structured water. The other question is coherence. How can we increase coherence in our body, in our water, in our body? And everyone remembers from the Institute of Heart Math that positive emotions create this kind of coherence, at least in the heart, in the electrical activity of the heart. Therefore, probably in the uh, dipole vacillations in the water in the body. Of course, the other thing you could do is you could actually um, visualize the water dipoles uh, and visualize them communicating with each other, singing together coherently in a synchronized fashion, however you want to visualize that. Oh, and then of course here I could bring up Norm Shealy's work. He does this sort of thing by applying uh, like energy fields to an acupuncture point. Then you get the energy directly into the acupuncture meridian system and distribute it throughout the whole body. Of course, you could put the energy in water and just drink it, which is what this thing is about. But you know, let's be practical here. If you're going to drink water, 
you, you might as well drink structured water. And if you want to put frequencies into your system, the frequencies to use would be, well, dance frequencies for sure, uh, in the Therify, which activate DNA. I've also discovered that 432 hertz is really very strong, uh, much stronger than 528 hertz uh, to actually activate DNA. And I found one article that activated microtubules with 500 hertz. So all you need is a simple signal generator and you can broadcast these fields into your body to help facilitate, awaken and transform our consciousness. Thank you. Leanne, that was wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. Such a, you know, depth of thinking and a, a real <laughs> lifetime work. So thanks, uh, Glenn. Let's do some questions, everybody. So I'm sure there's some questions. <clears throat> Overwhelmed everybody, huh? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> Glenn, Glenn, would you say that um, the, the model of consciousness as a centripetal negentropic plasma vortex would fit the measurements in that if that plasma vortex then became invested in it could account for not just the compression of fields that Tiller measured, but the actually actual increase in order. Well, yes, yeah, because you're the one that's that's linking all that to to coherence, and I'm linking the coherence to the water state and the consciousness state, well, as well as other people. So yes, this would be another way of generating the coherence yeah. and raise consciousness. I think your your work is fabulous here, and you're continuously extending it with water, et cetera. And also then the fundamental concept that as the bond embedding, the, the bond distances became longer, which is longer contact. Embedding of longer waves is always the embedding of more context richness in that sense. Like when DNA braids, a longer wave gets embedded that was never there before. Oh, okay. I had not made that point. That's a good point. Uh, the you see, that's what the dipole moment is all about. It's really about the charge separation and it's the distance between the charges. And I guess you're saying if you, in that case, if you're going to visualize the dipole, you could visualize it vibrating and oscillating, uh, or you could visualize what Dan just said, it increasing its length. Yeah, so that when, when your DNA braids in response to love or something, effectively you're, you're riding a longer wave and therefore your bigger things come into your attention. <laughs> there we go, exactly. Okay, well, I'm glad at least Dan had some questions. Come on, everyone else. With, with, uh, um, I am, I'm, uh, am I coming through? Yes, see you see me? <laughs> okay, yeah, um, great. Um, yeah, uh, my study with plants and water, I record the singing plants. And when you're in a negative state, the plants stop singing. But when you're in a happy state, right. nature right. sings and uh, everything. And then I also um, have done where I build a magnetic crown. So it's made out of meteorite going around the four points of the head. And then I use a zoomgite in the mouth um to create a positive and a negative cool. charge uh cool. with a mono signal and then i do stereo electro on the hands and the feet and the chakras so between your um waist your feet your hands that's all your meridians and then i have a meteorite chest piece and all that is all wired in stereo holophasic uh using the frequencies of the earth and of hydrogen and of oxygen um using the 432 tunings um i have different programs for different uh chakra based or thirds fizz so intervals are energy and then using the voice with the multi octavers and then you can create um very unique um because you with the zoom guide in the mouth it's electrifying the water so you're getting the uh zoom guide sphere and then i run it through a, a donut, a pulsed electromagnetic donut, the electricity with a Zoomgite rod. So the so not only are you purifying the electricity through Zoomgite, but it's also going through the pulsed electromagnetic fields of two um, torus donuts. Cool. So I run the electricity through that. So it's kind of, you know, that's as, as, as far as I've gotten in the water in my mouth tastes like Shasta water, like at the end <laughs> of it. Yeah, so like literally. 
Stephen, do you have a website to share with everyone? Like um, Serify.org, but I'm mainly uh, music production, multimedia immersion with multi-projection and a sound floor, that type thing. I do events, I do uh, superfoods, and, and I also have uh, my electromagnetic drink um, formula that I came up with is uh, orange, grapefruit, lemon, uh, pineapple, kiwi, fresh aloe, and then you have the spirulina, corella, wheat, barley, grass, whole oats, bee pollen, bee propolis, and you have, so you have your green herbs blended in with the fresh aloe, and, and the lemon and orange acts like a battery. So storing the electricity while I'm supercharging, I do have a violet ray um, with the noble gases, but I haven't been able to fold that in, but I just figured out with the sound table, if you do a Faraday cage around it, then you could run the plasma tubes and do cymatics. So sound on matter, bone induction sound. And um, through cymatics, you can really program uh, your water molecules. And so I use a sound chair that's got 4,000 watts and it goes down to 0.1 hertz. So you can, and I find that low frequency with the oscillation is a really fantastic way to kind of shift the dimensions, so to speak. Um, wow. And yeah, so- hey Glenn, do you, Glenn, do you have any comments with what Stephen's saying? And then we'll do some more questions here. Okay, well, I just want, is it, did you say therify.org? Se, yeah, S-E-R-A-P-H-I.org. And it's funny because Serify, he oh. came up with uh, Therify. Okay. Yeah, right, and right. I was and I was Serify yeah. back 20 years ago ah, in okay. San Francisco. Yeah. So that's what right. I, mean. I got it. So, no, I, I think Stephen's really on to some great stuff. Um, I like the idea of Organite. I, I had it uh, in the mouth um, I because I can use my method to measure saliva and uh -huh. I, I can I will actually do that experiment out of curiosity. So this is why you have these kind of things, Roger. So, he, you know, we inspire each other uh, to yep. do, in my case, to do more experiments. Um, I have done some work with crystals in water and the crystal energy is transferred to the water and can be measured. Uh, so I'm sure the, uh, and I had Shungai uh, and I have a mouth. So I And I would wire the Shungai you know, or a Jungai rod with the ball in your mouth. And you can do the pineal gland. You can also do the ears. So the electricity goes right towards the brain, which is interesting. Um, doing your ears and uh, also the back of your head where your occipital is. So doing the, the, the pineal gland and the occipital, the third eye, you can do your eyes, you can do uh, all sorts of points on the body um like like you said there's a million different ways to use it um yeah that's, cool. yeah. that's a good idea my only other comment was that your your uh, your drink with uh, uh, yeah. different, uh juices uh would be great to put some frequencies into that yeah and that's what we're doing we're drinking well, the juice still in the frequencies <laughs> of the giza frequencies the 432 ratios the solfeggio frequencies the solfeggio frequencies you have to be careful because you get really tired I think for sleep disorder centers, it's going to, uh, well, especially, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, but the 432, you can really, once you tune to the earth, you're much more magnetically uh, have an abundance of energy. But when you're doing the 528, it's kind of like repairing. It's good to do it before you rest at night because um, then you'll have a great night's rest. Um, so, you know, the you, we're all, it has to have its own category. You can't do both. You got to be careful, you know, when you do both. Okay, Glenn, um, we'll, we'll do some quick questions here, Glenn, that we really must take a break. So there's a question here in the chat window. During imprinting, does one must always use water external to the body and then ingest it? Or can one consciously affect the water within our own bodies by means of same process? Example, increasing renal function and moving edema? That's an interesting question. Yeah, <clears throat> um, you can do it the latter method, but bear in mind that you have to make sure you focus your intention because if you just put out the intention in, a, in broadcast it throughout your whole body, 
Yes, the water will absorb it, but so will all the proteins and so will all the DNA and so will all the amino acids. All the biomolecules will absorb it. And but it, I, I mean, if you want to get that information into the water, the best way to do it is to do it outside the body. If you just want to get the by the, that it, conscious intention into your body, then yes, you can do it with your intention. Absolutely. And it, it's not clear which is the better of the two. Right. Can you give examples of intentions you practice along with you raising your consciousness? Well, if my own personal self, I am pretty obsessed with the crown chakra and the pineal gland. And my intention is to align the two. And I visualize energy flowing between the two. Uh, but that's my own personal thing. You could, you know, I was trying to give you uh, other ways to do it. <laughs> yeah. uh, there's a question here from Ralph. Where do you produce structured water again? The uh, well, you can buy structured water, but the problem is structured water is not uh, doesn't last long. So either you buy one like Vivo that is uh, uh, not commercial. I mean, you you have to go to California to get it. The other thing, from my that's a great question, and the, the best way for me to do it would be to use a device like like Dan's imploder, or they have these structuring devices on the market. Uh, and I haven't really tested any of them, but it, it, they should work because they're based on Schauberger. The catch 22 is you got to structure it and drink it right away. Yeah, uh, there's a question here. Is distilled water and alkaline water both beneficial? Well, distilled water doesn't have minerals as someone pointed out. <clears throat> uh, uh, which is a problem, but it certainly soaks up energy and information quite easily and readily. And and mineral, I mean, the thing about minerals is you got to get the, the right minerals and the right ratios. Uh, and as I showed in my own data, mineralized water can actually uh, have opposite or different effects when treated with energy or intention. So, you know, the best thing is just, is to just drink structured water. Yeah. Uh, there's a question here from the wonderful Ashley from San Francisco. Do you know how long it takes to sufficiently structure water with the Therify? Assuming the water is purified first. Also, it's my understanding that the Therify structures the water in our cells. What is the minimum time for the Therify to do this, roughly? Does anyone know or have comments on this? Well, <clears throat> so uh, um, bear in mind now, the Therify generates a plasma wave. And I uh, did demonstrate that uh, it does, in fact, uh, increase the conductivity of water. I presented that at one of Roger's conferences uh, several years ago. Uh, I treat water with a machine for 24 hours because I want to make sure that it works. Electromagnetic fields do take that long. Scalar fields take somewhat less time. Plasma fields, I don't know. And consciousness takes even less time. So unfortunately, no one's really done a scientific study to answer that question. But if you want to know how, uh, uh, well, one way to measure that yourself would be with a pendulum and uh, to make sure the, the alter and the alternative approach would be just to do it for 24 hours and then you know you're covered. Okay, I think we've pretty much covered, I'm just checking through here. Four degrees. Yes, four degrees is the best temperature. Oh, yeah, what is happening if I drink structured water at four degrees, is it better than ambient temperature does temperature <laughs> modify its quality yeah that's a good idea because they say cold water is not good but cold water will maintain the structure longer true <laughs> yeah. has he ever tested the water after char charging water with the bio photon light uh the mm -hmm. only uh, experimental data that i know with light was uh was done by uh uh, Jer Jerry Pollack, and he showed that light expanded the the, the uh, coherent domain around uh, uh, molecules. So light is good, but then that depends on the wavelength of the light. Now we're not talking about frequency, 
and nobody's done a systematic study to look at oh, now biophotons. I mean, okay, so that's regular light. Biophotons are different. Biophotons come out of your hand, if you will. But so do electromagnetic fields, and so do torsion fields, and so do scalar fields. So when using and so do consciousness, because the experiments that I did with a healer, I call him that consciousness for the sake of this talk. But that is composed of biophotons and all these other different kinds of energies. So you can't really generate biophotons by themselves. So that's a hard question to answer. Right. <laughs> yep. Sounds good. Thank you very much, Glenn. You've got um, wonderful comments there. Everybody thoroughly enjoyed the presentation. Brilliant. Um, so, folks, um, I'll just.